This is a timely subject, of the United Front Against Fascism, uh, Dimitrov's famous speech to the 1935 Congress of the Communist International. Um, so in asking what it is and how do we build the fight against it. Uh, it's timely because the question of fascism is on the minds of millions. This is not uh, just a, a left -wing, minor left-wing obsession, it's on the minds of millions. Uh, for a number of reasons. Because of the uh, fascist and racist, racist groups and leaders that endorse Trump and see his campaign as their ticket to the political mainstream. Because of the focus by Trump and others on him as a charismatic leader, the answer to all our problems. Uh, because of the continuing and escalating chipping away at voting rights and democratic rights that have been going on for a number of years but escalated during this election in a number of alarming ways and promised to continue to escalate. And because of the speed and wide range of anti-people and anti-democratic measures and policies that Trump and his administration and his uh, the nominees uh, for his cabinet uh, are advocating. Um, so we're going to cover uh, five different sections. Um, first is misconceptions and semantic problems that we run into. Confusion because of the meanings of fascism and fascists and the multiple ways in which people use those words. We'll talk about three different myths about fascism. We'll talk about the dangers of fascism and over and underestimating the danger. And then finally focus on the United Front approach, Dimitrov's speech and the Popular Front, United Front idea. And then a few comments about uh, the United Front in today's U.S. Um, I don't have uh, any prepared discussion questions, but at the end of each section I'll ask for comments or questions. So some semantic and language issues. There are many different correct meanings to fascism and fascists. Fascism is an ultra-right supranationalist movement. It's an incoherent ideology that's sort of cobbled together to see what will appeal to amass enough people to amass a mass base for fascism. Or fascism is the terroristic dictatorship in itself, crushing all opposition by military means. Fascists are politicians who by attacking democratic rights, pave the way for a fascist dictatorship, even, even as they claim to represent the people or real Americans or hardworking Americans, etc. Uh, and fascists are leaders who wrap themselves in a cult of personality, claiming to embody a people, a nation, the only way to solve problems. These are all correct ways to use fascism and fascists, but if we don't make clear which one we're using, which meaning we have, uh, it can cause confusion. Uh, so, for example, there are definitely fascists in the Trump administration, uh, most notably Steve Bannon, his senior advisor and uh, one of the co-directors of his campaign in the last three months. But by saying there are fascists in the Trump administration, we are not saying that the U.S. is already in the grip of fascist dictatorship. We're not saying that such a dictatorship is weeks away, so we all better fall into a defensive crouch or go underground or start whimpering. Uh, we're not saying that the entire Trump administration is fascist, nor that every single person who voted for Trump is fascist, nor that every conservative is fascist and therefore lost to all potential for alliances. Just one example, Lindsey Graham, has a senator, Republican senator from South Carolina, uh, is reputed to be ready to propose a bill to protect the dreamers who have signed up uh, through the federal government and protect them from deportation. I, we don't know the details of what he's going to propose. Uh, likely it will not be a terribly good proposal, but it, it, it doesn't mean that there isn't potential to work with individuals on particular issues. We are also not saying that our mass political line should be only and explicitly about fascism and anti-fascism, nor that those others who are opposed to Trump but don't are not explicitly anti-fascist are somehow wrong or bad or mistaken. We're not saying any of those things. 
This is why we need to strive to be precise. Because fascism overlaps with, but is not identical to other terms and categories, authoritarian, anti-democratic, dictatorial. When we use the term, we should use it to mean people who are actively and consciously working to create a fascist movement or government. When we throw around fascism and fascist as a generic expletive, it does not contribute to the struggle. Uh, for example, the famous uh, episodes of the Seinfeld show that featured the soup Nazi. Well, that's, that's, a, that's silliness. It was intended as silliness. But when we use it in a casual way, uh, we do a disservice to people's understanding. We're not adding clarity to who the enemy is or how to fight them. Those generic terms used loosely and frequently end up desensitizing to the public to what exactly is threatened uh, when we warn of the fascist danger. So part of our role is to be precise in order to add clarity about who the enemy is, how to fight, and what it is exactly that we need people to unify around. And we can also, by being aware of these confusions, help the dialogue by asking others what they mean when they call someone fascist, to help them clarify their own thinking and strategizing. Uh, there are other assumptions people make about fascism, that it's only about anti-Semitism. It certainly is that, but it manifests differently at different times in different countries. In our country, it's a mishmash of white nationalism, overt racism, anti-immigrant hysteria, misogyny, homophobia, religious fundamental, faux patriotism, um, and advocacy of military action as the centerpiece to foreign policy. One thing that fascism is not is a coherent ideology, nor a static one. It is a political approach that maneuvers and uses uh, various means, including military means, but also political means and legal means and uh, public pressure means to try to crush dissent. Another important distinction to make is that fascism is not identical to the mass appeals of fascist politicians. Those appeals are part of the attempt to build a mass constituency and their, for the fascists and their policies, which they use to attack democracy. But the essence of fascism is not its mass appeal. That's merely the means they get to get the support to uh, try and uh, institute their policies. Uh, are there any quick questions about that section before we move on? If you, have a question, if you have a question, if you have a question, use your raised hand, my uh, your raised hand icon, and we can just a minute. There's someone. Okay, Greg. Now you need to open your mic, Greg Welton. Just click your your mic. I, okay, there you go. Yes, I was wondering at the uh, because you know the term fascist is thrown around so much. Is there, in fact, um, a way that we can um, um, identify, uh, but for instance, just not members of the Trump administration that may, in fact, have fascist tendencies, but recognize a time when we need to stand up and be very vocal about um, uh, indications in the, that might uh, um, uh, suggest that the uh, an administration is going that direction. Uh, well, I don't. I don't think there's any any uh, handy dandy formula to recognize that. That's part of the art and science of politics to recognize uh, the balance of forces, to recognize shifts in it, to uh, uh, help explicitly identify for the people that we work with what the dangers are, uh, not neither overstating nor understating those dangers. <clears throat> so I'm just advocating that we be clear about what we're saying, because not everybody is clear when they uh, throw around the term. So it's important for us to be clear, to, to help ourselves, to help others, and to clarify what the real struggles are. The real struggles are not uh, that they're coming to knock on the door tomorrow. But nonetheless, there are real struggles today that can stop the steps in the direction of fascism, and that's where, what we need to be focusing on now. 
Okay. So moving on to a few myths about fascism, as I've read uh, pieces over the last uh, month or so, uh, and as we hear people talk about it, there are some common misconceptions about the history and nature of fascism. And <clears throat> understanding these is a part of that project of being clear and helping others to clarify their thinking. Those, the three myths, myths that I'm going to talk about today are the one that says, as I saw in an article just about a week ago, remember Hitler was elected to power, which is a very common misunderstanding of a much more complex history. Another myth is that fascism is one thing, one set of beliefs, a static approach that it doesn't tack and weave with the political winds. And lastly, that the essence of fascism is in the will or personality or personal um, psychological problems of a fascist dictator. Um, so we'll talk about each of these in turn. Uh, first, a, a number of slides about uh, the myth that Hitler was elected. It certainly is true that Hitler and the Nazi party were the single largest party in Germany uh, in uh, the end of 1932. It was the single largest party and the single largest voting bloc. It's also true that, strictly speaking, Hitler became chancellor through mechanisms of the German constitution of the time. That's not the same as him being elected, however. Uh, and it is true that Hitler and the Nazi party pursued a strategy for a number of years, building up their appeal to German voters as a key element of their drive for power but it was not the only or sole method of uh, the strategy that they pursued. So while it is true that Hitler and the Nazi party relied on the start on at least partially an electoral strategy, uh, it's important to remember that most forms of fascism uh, have come about uh, through military means and through the total and um, open terrorist destruction of, of democratic alternatives or democratic means of uh, solving political problems. More typical of fascists is that they come to power through a, a military coup or through uh, military action or through direct action against the state. In Italy it was the March on Rome, in Spain the Spanish Civil War, in Portugal, in Chile there was a fascist coup by the military. In Japan it was militarists allied with the remnants of the feudal government. In Greece, it was a military coup. In Brazil, it was a military coup. In Batista's Cuba, it was a mix of military and electoral and uh, naked power uh, grab kind of thing. So we shouldn't have any preconceived notions about uh, some predictable set of steps that fascism will take in coming to power in any particular way. Uh, so some facts about Hitler's coming to power, becoming appointed chancellor. The immediate causes of Hitler's appointment as chancellor came as a direct result of pressure from German militarists and industrialists like Krupp and Thyssen in the early days of 1933. As close as the day before he did it, Hindenburg, the president, had publicly stated that he was not and would not appoint Hitler. So there was individual personal pressure by specific militarists and industrialists on him in, in the period of a, a day or so that resulted in the, the appointment of Hitler. And that came in part because during the two years prior, Hitler had made it his personal priority. In addition to public speaking to whip up mass support, he worked behind the scenes to connect to and reassure German financial elites. He understood that the Nazis would not come to power only through direct electoral means, that he needed the active support of major traditional power elites, financial and military. He and other Nazi leaders worked hard to make those connections and ties over a long period of time, and it paid off for them. But a key element, and this is an important point that gets lost, a key element of the decision by leading a German by leading German industrialists and militarists, that decision to throw their support behind Hitler's appointment as chancellor, was that while significant, the Nazi vote totals had started to decline. And I have a, this is not a complete list of all the elections that took place in Germany, but just some 
selected examples. In 1924, they got 2 million votes. In 1928, they had sunk to 800,000 votes. Uh, with the great coming of the Great Depression, uh, the in, intense economic uncertainty and confusion and pain and suffering, uh, they, they mushroomed uh, their public support. And in July of 1932, at their peak, they got over 13 million votes, which was 37% of the vote at that time. Whereas in July of 32, the combined socialist and communist vote was a slightly less, still over 13 million, but only 35%. However, by the second set of elections that year, in November of 1932, the Nazi vote had sunk to um, a little less than 12 million, and it also sunk to only 37% of the vote, whereas the combined socialist and communist vote had increased. It was about it was about approximately the same as earlier, but it had an increase to over 36% of the vote. So that shifting balance, uh, the the industrialists didn't feel like they. Uh, had to choose the fascist option because it might come to power anyway or they might not need it. Uh, so while the Nazis were the single largest party, when their support had started to decline, many right-wing industrialists thought that this might be their last chance to exercise the fascist option, that they were faced with a situation that would be either socialism or fascism. And so they picked socialism because they thought this might be their last chance to do so. So that uh, decrease in support for the Nazis, the opposite of Hitler being elected, was uh, a key element in the timing of how Hitler became appointed chancellor. Uh, another myth is that fascism is one thing, one set of beliefs, and the fascists promote this idea that they are strong men, that they are uh, personally strong and politically strong and militarily strong and committed to uh, firm principles of the nation. Uh, but as Palmiro Tagliati makes clear in his lectures on fascism, uh, fascist uh, parties do not operate from a fixed set of principles, though they try hard to make it appear that they do. But they rather do considerable packing and weaving to calm different sections of the populace or to appeal to them or to uh, avoid a confrontation that the fascists feel they can't win. Their principle is power, gross power, direct power. So how do they accrue it? How do they maintain it? Is That's their guiding principle and everything else is up for grabs. That's in terms of the fascist leaders and the fascist party itself. However, the fascist, fascist ideology that is part of how fascists appeal to masses of people is a different thing. It's a cobbled together toxic stew of nationalism, racism, authoritarianism, militarism, and faux populist appeals thrown in to make it appear that the fascists are working for the people or working against the entrenched interests. Uh, this, several of these points uh, echo strongly with some of the ways in which Trump ran his campaign. He did considerable tacking and weaving. Uh, his many statements are self-contradictory or he contradicts himself within the same day saying very opposite things. He's not, uh, does not have a fixed set of principles or policies. Uh, he has whatever will appeal to people to get him to power. It's also true that his appeal is a cobbled together toxic stew uh, aimed at backward sections of the U.S. people. <clears throat> a third myth is that we can search for the essence of fascism in the mindset or neuroses or uh, outlook of one fascist dictator, as if Hitler's will was what caused German fascism or um, Mussolini's will or Pinochet's strength of personality and military leadership. That, that's the essence of what fascism is. That's not true at all. Chilean fascism, for example, was indeed about Pinochet personally, but not only that. It was also about the CIA, about ITT, about Kissinger and Nixon. 
It was about a rejection of Chilean constitutional norms and practices, about alliances with old feudal landlords, about the Chilean comprador bourgeoisie, and more. So, for example, the rejection of Chilean constitutional norms and practices, uh, there were attempted coups throughout the almost three years that Allende was in office. They started early, uh, but those constitutional norms uh, provided a counterweight, and it took time for the fascists to prepare the ground adequately so that they could do away with the Chilean constitution and institute naked military rule. So too, steps towards fascism in the U.S. are in part about Trump's personal egomania, his hunger for power and attention, but that's not the essence of it. The danger lies, uh, sorry about the typo, lies not in his personality, but in the social and economic forces which see him as a vehicle for their own power and profit. The focus on Trump's personality while a valid part of the discussion, is often just a variation of the discredited great men of history theory that all history can be explained by uh, dominant personalities. Whereas really, as we see in Germany, it wasn't about Hitler's personality, it was about uh, his ability to put together a mass base and then the choice by militarists and leading industrialists to exercise the fascist option to maintain their power and control. Uh, uh, let me stop for again for a minute. Are there any questions or comments? And time for a water break too. Okay, use your raised hand icon to indicate if you want to ask a question. And I'm looking. There are a couple of people who wrote questions. Henry okay. says uh, there are many efforts to crush opposition and dissent. Please, can you give examples to distinguish between the fascist and the very conservative? And then John says, uh, would it be possible to get a copy of the PowerPoint written portion of the presentation? Um, it's certainly, I will, I, I'll send Dee a copy of this after I fix a couple of typos I've already noticed and send it to Dee and she can send it out uh, if you so wish to either you can send her an email asking for it or she can send it out to all the people who sign up. Uh, as far as examples, we, we will be talking a little bit more about that later when we're talking about the current situation in the U.S. Uh, but one thing is, is certain that there is not a um, clear and distinct line between the conservatives and the fascists. Right now they're allied with each other. So uh, I don't know that uh, Paul Ryan personally is a fascist and he certainly pretended to distance himself from Trump at various points during the campaign. But as soon as it was clear that Trump was elected and they would continue to have Republican majorities in the House and Senate, he started re-advocating his program of getting, you know, of, of uh, weakening and destroying Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, various other social programs. Things he's advocated for a long time but never previously felt like um, there was the realistic means of accomplishing them because they would always face a veto or a democratic uh, uh, filibuster or a majority in the Senate. So there is not a clear and distinct line. What there is a clear and distinct line uh, about is the steps that they take against democracy. And we'll be talking a little bit more about those. Uh, if there's no more comments, I'll go. There is one person who has his uh, hand up. William, okay. your, your, your mic is open. William? Okay, I'm sorry. This was a question from the last section. Okay. Uh, the question has to do with, uh, when we speak of fascism and use that word, fascism, is this simply a 20th century phenomenon? Or does this go back farther in history? Uh, well, I, I'm afraid that this is a, 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 a semantic or language confusion or problem. Fascism, in some respects, is a particular, particularly 20th century phenomenon. There have certainly been dictators, there have certainly been uh, 
military dictatorships. There have certainly been uh, many centuries of anti-democratic governments. But fascism is the particular alliance of the financial elite, the industrial elite, the military elite, and the ultra-right conservative movement to destroy democracy. And that, uh, before there was uh, this kind of industrial ruling class, um, the specifically fascist elements uh, were different. It doesn't mean that they were any worse, any less bad, or any less militarist, or any less anti-democratic, but it was that particular alliance with that section of the, of the ruling class. In, in, in Italy, uh, Mussolini spent many years kind of flailing around trying to define what fascism was, and they came to uh, declare that it was corporatism, which was the merging of the government and major industry. Uh, so that is a, a peculiarity of fascism as opposed to other kinds of dictatorship and dominance. Okay, moving on, uh, we come to the question, so uh, which some of these questions uh, are leading us to? What is the essence of fascism? Not what is it, its appeal to the masses? What bullshit does it sell in the public? Not what it claims as policy but how it actually acts and in whose interest it acts. Various thinkers and writers have often offered various definition, definitions and explanations. One uh, frequently cited uh, by uh, Hannah Arendt is that fascism is the result of re revolt of the dispossessed middle classes. Another one, or another theory already mentioned is the great man theory. It's all about Hitler and his psyche. Uh, another definition says it's it's just the rule of barbarism in politics. All of these have portions of the truth, but none of them, I think, get to the essence of it. Fascism does base much of its mass appeal on the perception, prejudices, uh, problems and needs and perceived needs and wrongs done to the middle classes or intermediate strata. So that is true that that's part of the mass appeal. And it's also true that fascism does end up with the dictatorship of an individual, so the personality of that individual plays an outsized role in developments. And fascism indeed is barbarism in politics, in words and in deeds. The naked military crushing of dissent, uh, imprisonment and murder of opponents, uh, total dispensing with democratic pretense. However, none of these explain, I'm sorry, I'm recovered from a cold. None of these explain why fascism is different from other right-wing trends, or why it resorts to barbarism in politics, nor which class fascism serves. These issues have been around as long as fascism has, and this is from Dimitrov's report. Fascism is not a form of state power standing above both classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. It is not the revolt of the petty bourgeoisie which has captured the machinery of the state. No, fascism is not a power standing above class, nor government of the petty bourgeoisie or the lump and proletariat over finance capital. Fascism is the power of finance capital itself. The classic Marxist definition of fascism comes to us through Dimitrov's report to the 7th Congress of the Communist International in 1935, which signaled a worldwide shift in communist strategy. This definition was not a theoretical exercise, uh, a question of uh, intellectual hair splitting, but it was developed in the course of actual political experience fighting fascism in several countries, not only Germany, but also Italy, Spain, and Portugal. And the classic Marxist definition is not based on what fascists say about themselves, nor a detailed examination of the electoral programs that they put forward, but on what fascism actually does, on the results of the policies they implement. And here's that definition, the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinist, and most imperialist elements of finance capital, succinctly put. So what does that mean? 
when we talk about the open fascist dictatorship, we're talking about the abrogation of all legal democratic possibility for protest and opposition. We're talking about the naked use of power, including military power, for political ends. And we're also talking about not just the ordinary succession of one normal government by another, but the power of finance capital, capital itself, organizing terrorist vengeance against the working class. So this is one of the reasons why the Trump administration, thus far at any rate, even before his inauguration, is not an open, open terrorist dictatorship. He's advocated crushing dissent. He's advocated anti-democratic things. He's advocated all kinds of anti-people programs. Uh, and he's certainly indicate, uh, um, uh, telegraphed his uh, authoritarian personality. But it is not yet an open terrorist dictatorship. There are still massive political space for protest, for organizing, for opposition, for building up the alliances necessary to defeat it. The next part of the definition of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialist elements. Fascists and authoritarians and conservatives are always with us. But it is these particular sections of the capitalist class that throw their support to fascists at crucial points, taking advantage of the fascist brutality to maintain their profits and dominant position in the economy. It is not the capitalist class as a whole which chooses fascism. Most capitalists, even big ones, prefer to rule using bourgeois democracy, hiding their schemes behind phony rhetoric as long as they can get away with it. So it is only the section that's ready to take the risk of doing away with democracy that supports the direct moving in the direction of fascism. And the last part of the definition is of finance capital. It's not just random reactionary capitalists who are crucial to fascists achieving power. It's the corrupt sections who make their money through speculation, through production for production rather than for direct consumer consumption. The fossil fuel industry as opposed to uh, the, the movie industry, for example, or the, um, uh, those who are engaged in uh, uh, you know, mass marketing. Uh, and when we talk about financial capital, so it, this is kind of an amorphous term. I'm not going to try and get to define it clear, uh, you know, uh, totally. But just for one example, there's six uh, uh, nominees or appointees to the cabinet or high office who are direct officers of Goldman Sachs. And this is so. This is Trump's alliance with direct alliance with finance capital and bringing finance capital directly into the government. So this is not fascism by itself, but this is moving in that direction. This is why we are worried about it. So what are the conditions that open the door to fascism? Since the preferred version of capitalist rule is representative, representative democracy, though please don't let it get too representative, when do they choose fascism? And there are some sort of uh, precursor conditions to the ruling class making that choice, to sections of the ruling class making that choice. When they can no longer rule in the old way, when the system has become delegitimized through war, civil war, economic crisis, political polarization, a crisis of legitimacy. Uh, we can see that both in the response to Sanders and to Trump, though there's, I don't, I'm not proposing any false equivalents, but those are both examples of how the, they can no longer rule in the old way. The old systems of class rule are breaking up. They're not working as well as they used to. Uh, the working class movement is not yet strong enough uh, or united enough to take power, but it is strong enough to be a credible threat to capitalist rule. Chile is a great example of, the, of this. The left had a foothold on power with the election of Allende and a major voting bloc in Congress, and that foothold on power was growing. Um, and that was why fascism uh, was not able to pull off a coup right when Allende was elected, but building up towards it over two and a half years or so, uh, they saw that uh, 
the, the popular unity government wasn't going to go away on its own. They weren't going to be able to defeat it through typical means. They only had the military option to defeat it before it got too strong. And it also depends on the mass fascist movement being big enough and strong enough to create a, situ a, a political situation which fascism solves for the ruling class. Um, the fascist movement, the mass aspects of it, are not the essence of fascism, but they're a crucial element of fascism. All this means is that we must not confuse the mass voting bloc for ultra-right politicians with the fascist political leaders themselves. It means that the key force for fascism is not the mass of voters, no matter how rabid or racist they are. It is the super-rich, financial capital itself. It means that a united working class front as the center of a broad popular coalition is the key to defeating fascism. Uh, just a note that often united front and popular front are used interchangeably and that's okay. They, in Dimitrov's report there's uh, some specific dif definitions uh, that uh, highlight some differences between them, but it's, it's not a major problem that we use them interchangeably often. It also means that the key question for fascists and for, and for those fighting fascism is power, holding power, seizing the political initiative, acting with audacity to grab hold of the levers of power, and in our country, acting boldly for the defense of democracy, people's power, and that's the broadest basis on which to fight the fascist power grabs and the ultra-right power grabs. We should note that fascism, as I said, is not a choice made by the entire ruling class. Uh, again, several quotes from Dimitrov. Fascism usually comes to power in the course of a mutual and a time. I'm, uh, part of my screen is covered up, sorry. A mutual and at times severe struggle against the old bourgeois parties or a definite section of those parties in the course of a struggle even within the fascist camp itself. And you can see that a, a big part of Trump's appeal to the ultra-right base, which has gained uh, power within the Republican Party, uh, was to attack the Republican Party itself, the Republican Party elites. It wasn't all about Obama or Clinton, it was also about the Republican elites and attacking them, and attacking them as a bankrupt. Another quote from Dimitrov. It is in the interest of the most reactionary circles of the bourgeoisie that fascism intercepts the dis disappointed masses who desert the old bourgeois parties. But it impresses these masses by the vehemence of its attacks on the bourgeois governments and its irreconcilable attitude to the old bourgeois parties. Well, in this case, unlike in Germany and in uh, Italy, we don't yet have a separate mass fascist party. This is all taking place within the Republican Party. But there are uh, the, part of what worked for Trump was the vehemence of his attacks on the old Republican governing elites. Another quote from Dimitrov, the working class must be able to take advantage of the antagonisms and conflicts within the bourgeois camp, but not, must not cherish the illusion that fascism will exhaust itself of its own accord. Fascism will not collapse automatically. And uh, nor, let me say parenthetically, since we do not yet have fascism, it is not immediately around the corner, neither will Trumpism nor the conservative stranglehold on our federal government collapse automatically. The, the, the purveyors of the, the worse it gets, the better it gets because it will expose things, don't understand the history of fascism in the world in which it has mostly either uh, been defeated by outside military force or by a struggle inside the country that took decades and decades uh, to come to victory. That was true in, in Spain, that was true in Portugal, that was true in Chile, that was true in Brazil. Uh, so I'll stop again and see if there are questions or comments. Okay, if you have any questions, use your raised hand icon to... Okay, Mark, your, your mic is open. Thanks. I'm curious about why 
uh, recognizing that um, only baby steps so far are being taken in the direction of what might become a fascist movement and a fascistic government. I'm curious about your assessment about why um, finance capital would, or some sectors of it, would be taking these risks with someone like Trump when they were getting so much of what they wanted from Obama and Clinton. Um, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm afraid that's, that, that doesn't admit of a short or quick or brief uh, response. Uh, I don't know that the steps that they the steps that they've taken are a little bit past baby steps. I think, uh, and as well, there are sections of finance of capital, the fossil fuel industry, for example. Um, some other uh, military uh, industrial sections of the military industrial complex that while we should have no illusions about Clinton or, or Obama, they were not getting everything they needed. They do see developments proceeding uh, to be a threat to them. For example, if Clinton had been elected with the support of Sanders on a, uh, a program of addressing climate change, even though they wouldn't have addressed it enough, they still would have been a threat to the profits and dominant control of the fossil fuel industry. Um, it's not a cut and dry thing, but there are real risks to them in the current situation. And that is why th this is true, not just in the US, but worldwide, we see a rise of these kind of ultra-right movements in France, in Germany, in the Scandinavian countries, in Greece. Um, and so the fascist danger is a worldwide phenomenon, not equal everywhere uh, and certainly more threatening in some places. Um, but uh, part of what's happening is the breakup of the old ways of doing things is no longer working. It's no longer sufficient for the Republicans, for example, the Republican establishment, to trot out their tried and true experts to say uh, Trump is uh, a loony tune. They did that and it didn't work. Uh, it's no longer sufficient in the Democratic Party to trot out the elites and say Bernie Sanders is a loony tune, ignore him. That didn't work. The old methods are no longer working, and they are shifting around, searching for something that will continue to work for them. And they are indeed taking a risk on Trump, and that's the the risk that they take with any fascist uh, or any uh, authoritarian figure, uh, because it, it's like they say we can only maintain our control by um, bringing the crazies in, but the crazies you can't control them, and they will indeed attack other parts of the capitalist class, they will feather their own nests, they will do all kinds of crazy things that will are, are a risk to the system. Uh, but for in the calculations of some, like Rex Tillerson, for example, this is a risk worth taking. Uh, Obama putting sanctions on Russia, that, that, which is a much longer discussion, I don't want to get into that, but part of those sanctions was putting on hold a $500 billion deal between the Russian oil company and ExxonMobil. We're not talking chump change here. We're talking about serious business. And the current administration was a risk to them doing whatever the hell they wanted. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and go on. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the, the coming sections. There are some written, written questions. Um, mm -hmm. on another mark as uh, uh, for a reading list, um, and uh, Janice asks, uh, from what I analyze, we can defeat Trump fascism by way of people power. That's a statement. Benjamin, could you quickly speak to who the six Goldman Sachs cabinet members are? Janice, again, people power by coordinated sync. Uh, synchronized and orchestrated moves to impeach Trump, set the rule of law by indicting him and convicting him. Gary, Gary says, is there a parallel in fascist definitions to Sheldon Wolin's inverted totalitarianism? 
All right, so there are several other, um, yeah, okay. Uh, I'll, I have a short reading list at the end and I'll, at the very end of this uh, slideshow and I will uh, recommend a few others in addition. Um, indeed, people power is the way to defeat them. It's the only way to defeat them. And we can't now know the exact strategy that will result in the defeat. If it's through impeachment, if it's through the midterm elections, if it's through a constitutional crisis, if it's through a, a legal challenge to Trump because he's violating the emoluments clause of the Constitution, if it's um, you know some other thing, we, can, we, we can't predict in advance uh, what the exact strategy towards victory and to defeating the, the uh, right-wingers will be. Uh, we can, can but be ready and be participants in the struggle. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with inverted totalitarianism, so I, I can't speak to that. I wouldn't be surprised, but I, I don't know, I wouldn't know whereof I was speaking. Um, I, I don't have uh, in front of me the six uh, cabinet positions or top appointees from Goldman Sachs, but uh, I think the Treasury Secretary, Steve Bannon, who's the senior advisor, worked at Goldman Sachs, uh, and there's a number of others, several other cabinet positions and several um, at the sort of undersecretary level or department level. Uh, and you can find those out online with a quick Google search, I'm sure. Uh, so. I'm sorry, I, I might have missed a question there. I, my note is unclear. Uh, so I'll move on. Uh, estimating the dangers of fascism. And this is, um, this has uh, implications for how we talk in public, what our mass political line is, for how we prepare ourselves. <clears throat> and it's a question that it's important for us to get it right because the danger of fascism is greater than it was six months ago or a year ago or eight years ago. Um, the danger of fascism uh, can be seen in the steps, whether they're baby steps or slightly more advanced, toddler steps toward, in the direction of uh, destroying major democratic rights. Um, but it's also true that uh, we're not, we're not at the stage of an open terrorist dictatorship and we shouldn't act like we are. We shouldn't uh, light our hair on fire and run screaming down the street or hide under the covers or send major sections of our leadership underground. So how do we get this balance right? And I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to answer that question quite as much as point to some problems of over or underestimating. In Germany, before Hitler's appointment as chancellor, communists thought of the social democratic parties, unions, and associations as the main obstacle to a revolution, and therefore directed some of their sharpest attacks on the social democrats. Uh, this is an oversimplification. I don't mean to uh, wipe out. There were some very serious reasons for the, the conflicts between the social democrats and the communists, and building unity between them would not have been an easy task. Nonetheless, it was the task that was pri uh, uh, of primary importance. That underestimation of the danger had dire consequences for the working class of Germany, for the world, for unions, and for the party itself. The opposite problem is, uh, is exhibited by our own party, in part in reaction to the German party being caught unprepared. Our own party went to the, in the other direction in the late 40s and early 50s during the McCarthy period. We estimated that fascism was on the way, or at least some of our leadership did. We sent mem um, major sections of our leadership underground. We advocated disbanding some mass organizations. We dropped members who were thought unreliable. So we overreacted. We thought it was, uh, we did not take full advantage of the democratic potential for protest, organization, resistance, and opposition. So that's why it's important to get it right. Uh, Dimitrov says, in our ranks, there was an impermissible underestimation of the fascist danger. 
to the effect in countries that in countries of classical bourgeois democracy, the threat of fascism does not exist. Such opinions have served and may serve to relax vigilance towards the fascist danger and to render the mobilization of the proletariat in the struggle against fascism more difficult. A particular example of this was in Chile, which had a long, proud history of constitutional government and a long tradition of keeping the military out of politics, and people thought that protected them from fascism. It was an important factor. It helped delay the takeover of fascism, uh, but it was not a barrier to fascism. And that's true in our country. We have a long, proud history of constitutional government and keeping the military out of politics to a large degree. <clears throat> um, and it's important for us to insist on that, those traditions, but they are not some kind of ultimate uh, protection against the dangers of fascism. So either underestimating or overestimating the fascist danger can cause harm. An underestimation leads to targeting the wrong forces, uh, directing our attacks in a negative direction rather than at the real enemy. Uh, an overestimation leads to prematurely abandoning room for struggle for the political space for protest and organized resistance. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, oversimplify, however, uh, more than I need to. There were real steps towards fascism in the U.S. during the McCarthy period. Uh, the party did wage public and democratic struggles for rights and against those steps towards fascism. Legal fights, public fights, uh, mass petition campaigns, demonstrations, all kinds of things. So the, uh, but still, the party made itself smaller, sent too much of its leadership underground, and isolated itself from key allies. An example was the National, League, National Negro Labor Council, which the party had been a key element of, and the party worked to disband it against the wishes of other key members, including, for example, Coleman Young, who was, came from the Auto Workers Union. So we isolated ourselves unnecessarily, and we cut ourselves off from allies and members who would have been helpful in waging the biggest, most public um, democratic opposition campaign. That was a short section, so I'm just going to proceed on to uh, the next section, what the United Front approach is, some, ele some lessons, analogies, and tasks. <clears throat> this will have a, a few Dimitrov quotes. Uh, however, I want to urge us not to be dogmatic. We don't, not only do we not have to be dogmatic, we must not be. The political situation in the U.S. working class is complex and different from Europe in the 1930s. For example, there are two major competing union federations, one led by socialists, one led by communists. Therefore, to have an abstract schema of how working class unity can be built into which we try and force our very different reality will not work. When you read Dimitrov talking about building a, 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 working, a united front working class uh, alliance between socialists and communists, that was because those were the two major working class parties, which if they had been able to unify, had uh, more mass appeal than the fascists did, and a great political strength. Um, so we can't just translate it automatically. The general rules work, but the specifics don't work at all. Uh, in our country, the building of massive linked coalitions will not come in a prepackaged, handy, and simple format. There won't be one organization all united under the banner of the United Front Against Fascism. There will rather be a series of temporary, permanent, uh, and uh, uh, varying alliances, struggles, coalitions, and working partnerships which together make up the resistance between them. So we shouldn't have a preconceived notion about what the ultimate strategy will be or what the ultimate alliances will look like, because it's not yet clear how open the fascist sections of the Trump administration will be, nor how fast or hard they will go after democracy. 
We know there are fascists in his administration. We know they are already attacking democracy. But the full outline of their approach is not yet clear. Not to us, but also, and more importantly, not to the tens of millions who can be won to resistance. Dimitrov says, we are enemies of all cut and dried schemes. We want to take into account the concrete situation at each moment, in each place, and act according and not act according to a fixed stereotypical form anywhere or everywhere. Uh, not to forget that in varying circumstances, the position of the communists cannot be identical. So there are rising fascist dangers around the world at what they do in Germany or in France or in Sweden or in Norway or in Greece will be linked to our struggle, but it will not be identical. We, we too, just as the fascists tailor themselves to specifically US, uh, the US political situation and cultural situation, so too we have to tailor our, our approach. But resist we must. So here's where we get we get back to the earlier question about how do you tell the difference between uh, the the conservatives and the fascists? Um, unfortunately, right now they're in a very clear alliance, and for years now the Republicans, conservatives, fascists, Looney Tunes, sensible ones, all of them have been attacking basic democratic rights, voting and registering registering to vote rights early voting and convenient poll stations, eliminating voters from the rolls, using social media to avoid and go around the press, using control of state legislatures to impose emergency managers of uh, virtually disbanding um, local governments, attacking limits on campaign contributions and donor transparency, the Citizen United phenomenon, gerrymandering uh, legislative districts, uh, using the hold that they have on power to subvert stand of op standard operating procedure, as we've just seen in North Carolina. Because a Democrat won, the Republicans immediately called a special session and began trying to strip all power from the government, the governor's office. Uh, that's not business as usual. That's not normal U.S. politics, but that is what they are doing. And that's one of those signs that this is not just a normal conservative operating procedure. This is something different. Uh, they also have all collaborated, uh, a fact which some of them are now regretting, in creating a post-fact alternate media universe of right-wing memes and personalities, where vitriol and anger and um, unsubstantiated accusations substitute for reality. And that's not just Fox News, but also uh, Rush Limbaugh and the, a plethora of right-wing radio talk show hosts. Um, it's also uh, one of the ways that they use social media and um, fake news and all that kind of stuff. The Republicans have also greatly escalated their use of filibuster and senatorial hold processes to gum up the works to prevent the Obama administration from achieving more victories or even just solving problems and so much more. So right now the, the, the worst of them and the bad but not the worst are collaborating on doing all of these things. And these steps, not the particular wishes or desires of the particular conservatives, but these steps are attacks on democracy, and that those attacks on democracy are what lay the basis for moving in the direction of fascism. Dimitrov says, before the establishment of a fascist dictatorship, bourgeois governments usually pass through a number of preliminary stages and adopt a number of reactionary measures which directly facilitate the accession to power of fascism. Whoever does not fight the reactionary measures of the bourgeoisie and the growth of, growth of fascism at these preparatory stages, in other words, right now, is not in a position to prevent the victory of fascism, but on the contrary, facilitates that victory. He also says um, that it's a mistake to underrate the importance for the establishment of the dictatorship of the reactionary measures, these uh, preliminary stages and reactionary measures that they are adopting, which suppress the democratic liberties, 
falsify and curtail the rights of parliament, even a bourgeois parliament, and intensify the repression of the revolutionary movement. So our fight is not only about protecting democracy, but that has to be the framework around which we organize many of these fights on many discrete issues. To fight and protect and extend democracy is the broadest basis for the broadest alliance. It bases itself on the long history in the U.S., both of promoting the U.S. democracy as the best in the world, so people have the illusion that that's what we ought to be, and also as a result of the long struggle throughout our history to extend that democracy from white male property owners to all white males to males of all races to women to younger people to defeating poll taxes and other schemes to disenfranchise African Americans. So that threat, uh, that thread of uh, fighting for full and complete democracy runs throughout our history and when we base ourselves on that we link to deep parts of US culture. We will be fighting Trump on many fronts uh, and those front, those battles will be waged by a shifting set of alliances. But the fight for democracy is the broad framework uh, which will be the sort of organizing principle linking together these many struggles. And the fight for democracy is not just a fight for an abstract democracy and it will be limited because it's a fight in part for saving bourgeois democracy. But what we are really fighting to protect is the political space for protest, resistance, organization, and mounting account our ability to mount a counteroffensive in all of the struggles that we're engaged in. <clears throat> we can learn from the experience of anti-fascist movements of the past. The key understanding which must underline all our strategy and tactics is that the central task is getting masses into motion. Dimitrov speaks, what did Le why did Lenin attach such exceptionally great importance to the form of transition to the proletarian revolution? Because he had in mind the fundamental law of all great revolutions. The law that, um, that for the masses, propaganda and agitation alone could not take the place of their own political experience. When it is a question of attracting really broad masses of the working people to the side of the revolutionary vanguard, without which a victorious struggle for power is impossible. In other words, we can't just wage a victorious struggle unless we win masses of the working people to our side. Uh, Dimitrov goes on to say, it is a common mistake of a left leftist character to imagine that soon as a political or revolutionary crisis arises, it is enough for the communist leaders to put forth the slogan of revolutionary insurrection and the broad masses will follow them. Not even in such a crisis, the masses are even in such a crisis, the masses are by no means always ready to do so. So we have to prepare the ground by helping to move masses into motion so they gain their own political experience. That's the basis for winning them to a consistently anti-fascist program. Dimitrov says, we need not be dismayed, comrades. If the people mobilized uh, to fight for their day-to-day -day interests consider themselves either indifferent to us or even followers of fascism, the important thing for us is to draw them into the movement. Going on, we must find and advance those slogans and forms of struggle which flow from the vital needs of the masses, from the level of their fighting capacity at the present stage of development. We can't pretend the working class, the labor movement, the alliances are stronger than they really are. We have to find the slogans and forms of struggle which speak to this moment that will advance um, the fighting capacity and will turn people out into the streets and will lead millions of people to gain their own political experience in sharper struggle. We want to draw increasingly wide masses into the class struggle and lead them to the revolution proceeding from their own vital interests and needs as the starting point and their own experience at the basis. Just saying workers should be opposed to capitalism doesn't make them so. 
they have to gain through the struggle for their own vital needs and interests, their own experience in the, politi the political struggle. Masses in motion are the way in which workers and allies gain experience, knowledge, and learn how to work out uh, any problems in those alliances. So while we must preach about fascism and socialism and the need for fundamental change, by itself that will not lead masses to our party or to the left or to resistance. Preaching is one piece, but it's the smallest piece. Our main focus has to be on getting masses into motion, because without their own experience, workers will not learn why the things that we say matter. They will not be ready to forge the necessary alliance, alliances, and they will not be ready to take the risks of struggle. We don't need to invent struggles. They are going on all around us. We help get masses in motion, not by sloganeering or by founding an organization called the United Front Against Fascism. There have been various uh, Trotskyite and ultra-left groups that have done exactly that and uh, to no more than temporary success at best in local areas. But we start from the real struggles that are going on right now, working to unite movements already in progress. Uh, no to the Dakota Access Pipeline, fighting for voting rights, fighting for equal rights and for women's health, against police brutality, for a living wage, for health care for all, and among others, those who are already signed up following the Indivisible Guide. If you don't know, it's worth a look. It's a guide written by some former congressional staffers on how small groups in each, district, each uh, legislative district can most effectively lobby their Congress people. And there's something like 3,000 or 3,500 groups already signed up and already starting to engage in that. And in fact, we've already seen a couple of examples of Republican Congress people uh, running from their own town halls or coffee clatches uh, because they're confronted with serious opposition, not uh, national opposition at some grand demonstration, but by their own constituents uh, making direct demands on them to be represented. So those are some of the struggles that are already going on. Dimitrov says we must find and advance those slogans and form of struggle which arise from the vital needs of the masses, from the level of their fighting capacity at the present stage of development. And we learn that by being participants in those very struggles. We seek to unite many mass movements, the peace movement, the women's movement, the immigrant rights movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, and other civil rights organizations and struggles, the Fight for 15, the environmental movement, the labor movement, the youth movement, for example, for free college tuition, for high quality public education, the seniors movement, protecting and improving Social Security and Medicare, and many more. These are the mass movements already in process, which have links to each other already, and we can provide a, we can be a catalyst to improve those alliances and coalitions. One of the things that we bring, not we're not the only ones who bring it, but it's a key point that we bring, is understanding that the key to unity is the struggle against racism, and that the biggest obstacle to unity is the promotion of racism by the ultra-right. Racism unites ultra-right movements. Racism is the main, though not the only way, in which the fascists and the ultra-right appeal to a mass base. Racism can be used to divide people's movements. It's the main obstacle to building the necessary alliances. And without multiracial unity against racism, all other battles and alliances will be weakened. And just as our working class is multiracial, multinational, multigender, multigenerational, so too the movement to defeat steps toward fascism, steps against democracy, against civil rights of all kinds, against programs that benefit millions of our people, against uh, the steps to prevent the right to protest and organize. That movement must be multiracial, multinational, multigender, multigenerational. And we can conceptualize that unity by thinking about the movements already going on and how to uh, link them, how to build coalitions and working partnerships. We also think of it in the terms that we've been discussing over a number of years as building unity and alliances between the core forces, 
labor and the entire working class, people of color, women, and youth. In an odd way, the ultra-right is pointing the way to the unity we need by engaging in a bold, broad assault on democracy, on workers, on people of color, on women, immigrants, the environment, education, public lands, regulations, and much more. They help set the agenda for all those working on those issues to unite and gain strength from each other. Uh, Dimitrov says, since it is a dictatorship of the big bourgeoisie, and this is, um, well, I'll parenthetically say, even though we're not yet at a di dictatorship of the big bourgeoisie, we ha face a government led by the big bourgeoisie in the direct person of members of the big bourgeoisie. Uh, and that must inevitably come into conflict with the mass social base. All the more since under fascist dictatorship, the class contradictions between the pack of financial magnets and the overwhelming majority of the people are brought out in greatest relief. Uh, this is not saying that the worse it gets, the better it gets. It's merely pointing out to the reality that before we get to the open terrorist dictatorship, we can use their program to help us clarify why we need broad alliances. And we can't decide now in advance uh, the one strategy or one tactic or one type of protest that is the best. That will development out, out of, develop out of the movement itself. The movement throws up changes in form, changes in strategy, changes in slogans. Um, for example, the Bolsheviks didn't start off uh, planning that the Soviets would be the instrument of taking over and running a new government. The struggle itself created those Soviets, and Lenin had the genius to understand their potential. So it, we don't invent these struggles. They happen. When people are in motion, learning the lessons of struggle from their own experiences, that is what is key, not any one particular tactic. But too often, people want to judge movements by militancy alone. Are we militant enough? Are we angry enough? Are we uh, disgusted enough with the current system? Uh, militancy indeed is one aspect, one measure of uh, the mass resistance and it is essential to that resistance, to stepping up the struggle. But by itself militancy can be hollow and sloganeering. When we say that mass resistance is essential and the only way to defeat Trumpism, we are saying that the mass character is what is the key element of it. Uh, and with our role as being to help build alliances and unity and clarify the struggle and clarify who the main enemy is, we know that the movement must be militant, organized, and mass in character. Downplaying any of these elements harms the struggle in the long run. So for example, we can count on a tremendous spontaneous outpouring this coming Saturday in the in the women's marches that are happening all over the country. They will be bigger than the inauguration by, by an order of magnitude. Uh, they will, the, the response to them is in very large part spontaneous. To the degree we can turn that spontaneity into organization, we will strengthen the struggle. To the degree that the organization and the masses are linked, we strengthen the struggle. To the degree that we can get millions of people to adopt a militant program, we strengthen the struggle. But when we focus on the organization to the exclusion of all else, we limit ourselves to too small a sphere of operation. When we use militancy alone to measure it, we cut ourselves up from those who are ready to oppose Trump but are not yet militant about it. Uh, and when we uh, try, we ignore, or we focus rather, on the mass character and the spontaneous character of the opposition already in existence without linking it to organization, uh, it will be difficult to, to sustain the kind of protracted struggle we will be engaged in over the entirety of the Trump administration. <clears throat> Dimitrov says that the working class must be able to take advantage of the antagonisms and conflicts within the bourgeois camp 
but it, not, it must not give in to the illusion that fascism will exhaust itself of its own accord. It will not collapse automatically. And that's true of fascism. It's also true of ultra-right, uh, egomaniacal leadership. It won't collapse of its um, own weight, though sometimes it seems like it ought to. Some of it is so stupid. Dimitrov again. Only the revolutionary activity of the working masses can help to take advantage of those conflicts which inevitably arise within the bourgeois camp. And when we link it to our struggle to undermine the steps towards fascism. So I want to make clear, even though we are a long way from fascism and fascism is not right around the corner and we uh, shouldn't act like it is, now is the time to fight all the steps against democracy, against the right to protest and organize, and against attacks uh, on programs that meet people's needs. Now is the time to build lasting unity among many movements. Uh, a, a resistance without a fight to address people's real needs is necessary to reverse the political direction of the U.S. It's not enough that people are opposed to Trump. It's not enough that he be exposed. It has to be, a, and it's not enough to engage in defensive struggle. All those have to be linked to a program that will really address people's needs. And while he's, the, the tack that he's taking is uh, certainly debatable whether it's perfect or not, uh, Sanders is trying to do exactly this, advocating for free college tuition, advocating for increasing Social Security benefits, advocating for all the things that Trump is attacking, advocating a positive to solutions. So we have to be clear of what shift has taken place. There was a big shift that has taken place as a result of the election, but it was not some massive shift among white workers towards explicit racism, though there was certainly some shift in that direction. Uh, the real shift was in who has the political initiative. The right now has the power to move aggressively on many fronts, forcing us into many related but disparate defensive battles. And that is a big shift and a big problem for us. So we need to find a way to take the initiative away from the ultra-right by handing them defeats, by building institutional sources of opposition, by exposing their real anti-democratic agenda, and by acting aggressively based our con on our confidence in our class and people. So lastly, here's, here's a, the start of a reading list. Um, I suggest reading the continuing coverage in the people's world on the elections, on the struggles, and on the unity, and on the theory. There have been a series of recent articles by C.J. Atkins, John Bechtel, Roberta Wood, and by me, and those are all good places to start. And then I address some of these questions in more detail. Uh, another step is to read the full text of Dimitra's United Front Against Fascism or read the excerpts that went out with the invitation uh, to this class. Another book is that's soon to be reissued by international publisher, publishers is Togliatti's Lectures on Fascism about the complexities of fascist policy and the changing nature of the struggle against fascism. Another book that I highly recommend is Allende's Chile by Edward Burstein also from international publishers. And it's a very accessible explanation of why strategy is important and about how and why the fascists in Chile operated the way they did, how thorough they were about preparing the ground for a, a fascist uh, coup. It didn't just happen, it was prepared. And he goes into that in great detail and also talks about uh, why strategy is important, why mistakes in strategy lead to problems, and uh, about some of the pitfalls to, to avoid. So I think that uh, concludes my presentation. Um, so the floor is open for uh, discussion, questions, and uh, your thoughts. OK, use your raised hand icon to uh, indicate if you want to make a comment or introduce a question, I'm looking through the list. There's some people who have written questions. 
Okay. Gabe says, would you say we are at or near the highest stage of capitalism, and if so, does it follow that capital will try to usurp democracy? Uh, I, I don't think we, we know that, and I don't think there is anything inevitable about the success of anti-democratic measures. That they will try and do that is obvious. They are trying to do it and have been doing so for years. Um, and their crisis of, of uh, being able to rule in the old way and that not working so well anymore uh, is a sign of um, the, the stage of capitalism that we're at. But the whole idea of stages is not that there is some inevitable progression from one to the other or some uh, inevitable outcome to those struggles. The biggest determinant of how close fascism comes in this country is what we do. The struggle against it, uh, the fight for democracy, our success in building alliances, and we can defeat all of their attempts, uh, but it will take a long, protracted, protracted uh, difficult, and shifting struggle to do so. Okay, another question is from Eric. Uh, is the idea of uh, a vanguard uh, is the idea of a vanguard party still useful or applicable? Um, well, that's that's a little uh, beside the direct point of of this class. Just from uh, previous debates on this, um, when we were working on the new draft of the program for the party and the uh, before the 2005 party convention. This was a particularly contentious issue because we did not use the phrase vanguard party in the program and some people saw that as a sellout. Uh, our contention, su supported by a majority at the convention and by a majority of the party, was that the a vanguard role is not something we declare, it is something we win. It is constantly won and rewon through our actions, and we can play the role of a vanguard not by declaring ourselves to be so, but by acting so in real life struggles. Okay, well, I, I thank you for listening. I thank you for participating. I thank, thank those who wrote in questions, who uh, who spoke their questions or spoke their comments, and uh, this is uh, an, a, a, an aspect of uh, developing our, a successful political strategy that will be with us now for some time to come. So this is not the final word, I'm not the final answer, and we will find those final answers in the process of the struggle. And I thank you for helping me stick to an hour and a half. Uh, there is another, uh, Rebecca, your mic is open. Um, my question is, I have read some uh, books on, that have fascism scales and they gave different points to um, to how much the government and corporations were involved in um, in processes together. I wasn't, and it, by looking at them, I almost thought we were all met ready at a fascist state because so much of this had been going on before Trump with mm -hmm. citizens united and and that type of thing. Are those reliable? I, I've never, I was picking this particular class because I don't understand the relationship between corporate America and fascism because sometimes the government seems to have so much conflict with what corporations want to do. Well, the, the, one of the reasons why typically um, the ruling class prefers some form of bourgeois democracy is it's a forum in which they work out their differences. Uh, it's not um, power held by one section of the class. Um, but uh, there's a very clear indication of why we don't have fascism. We just have this conversation. The open terrorist dictatorship is based on uh, a merger between corporate power and government power, but that's not the only aspect of fascism. Fascism is also the open terrorist dictatorship of that section. It is the active crushing of all opposition. It is the elimination of the democratic space to protest, organize, and resist. And 
there's a lot of space to resist. And if we think that fascism is already here, we won't take advantage of those full range of opportunities to organize a successful, powerful, and mass opposition to Trump's policies. Okay, let's see if Gary's... Gary, can you speak now? All right, we still don't hear you, Gary. Sorry. Gary probably wants to say that the Totally Adi book uh, will be available soon, and we'll do a book talk. Uh, on uh, when the when the totally Adi book on fascism is released. All right, if you want to say your conclude uh, concluding remarks again, Mark, uh, because uh, Ken seems not to. Yeah, be... it, it, it's not it's not a perfect system. I thank people for trying, even if uh, there were technical difficulties. Um, like I say, this is. Uh, the process of developing a successful strategy to defeat the steps toward fascism, it will be a process. It's not a matter, uh, it's important to learn the lessons of history, it's important to study the experiences and the lessons uh, that other people resisting fascism elsewhere, at other times and in other places, we need to learn from them, but we cannot um, just memorize the definition and that that's the be-all and end-all. That's the start of developing a strategy. To understand where the danger of fascism comes from, to understand what steps they will take and the way they will take them uh, is important, but we also have to be actively engaged in the struggle, and that struggle will teach us the lessons that we need to know to develop unity, uh, to engage in defensive struggles that administer defeats to Trump's program, to engage in offensive struggles which uh, uh, seek solutions uh, to people's problems like the fight for 15, like free college tuition, like any number of things. Um, and that process, this is one step in that process, so I thank you for participating with me in this particular step of our process of defeating the ultra-right rejecting their stranglehold on our federal government, um, and building a resistance movement mass enough, strong enough, militant enough, and capable enough to defeat uh, the ultra-right. So I thank you.